Good Acting. morning. I call this meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order and note for the record that a quorum is present. Our first order of business is approval of the minutes from Monday, April 8th, 2024. Vice Chair Edelson, can I get a motion for approval? So moved, Madam Chair. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. Our, we have two items of business today, House File 4444 and an amendment to the budget resolution. So we will start with House File 4444. Representative Greenman, welcome to the committee. I move that House File 4444 be placed on the general register. So please proceed with describing your bill and specifically why we're seeing it in Ways and Means. Uh, well, thank you, Madam Chair, um, and good morning, members. Um, House File 4444, um, if for folks who haven't um, seen it yet, it's been through four committees. Um, it's a bill that strengthens protections for Minnesota workers um, and our businesses and taxpayers by improving the ability to fight um, employer misclassification fraud. For the purpose of Ways and Means, I'm going to focus on the fiscal note and the impact um, of the legislation um, uh, um, that's under jurisdiction of this committee, so both the, the costs and, um, and the additional revenue. Um, and as I said, we've had a robust policy discussion um, in uh, this will be the fifth committee stop. Um, just to ground us, I will give a, a, a slight background about what the issue is um, and why it's necessary uh, to address this problem. So as, as all of us know, Minnesota has a, has a long tradition of providing and protecting economic security, security and the social safety net for generations of Minnesotans. And all of that is put at risk with this problem of misclassification fraud when a, when a worker is misclassified as an independent contractor and they should be an employee. When you're an employee, you get minimum wage and overtime, you get access to unemployment insurance, workers' compensation if you get hurt on the job, and now paid, um, uh, uh, earn safe and sick, as well as paid time to care. And if you face discrimination on the job, you also have laws that will protect you. Um, when you are misclassified as an independent contractor while doing the work of an employee, um, you are deprived of all those legal protections and benefits, plus you pay your boss's share of the payroll taxes. This problem also impacts law-abiding businesses uh, that we heard testimony can struggle to compete against companies that artificially reduce their costs um, uh, um, by uh, uh, cheating the workers and the taxpayers. And it hurts taxpayers and communities um, uh, that fund and rely on the social safety net. Um, so it affects our, our state and federal government finances through lower program and tax revenues and increased reliance on local uh, government services. This is a big problem um, for folks who saw a couple of weeks ago, the OLA did a report um, where they reported that um, they report, did one in 2007, they updated it in 2024. The problem in misclassification has only grown and unfortunately our current policy approach to detecting, preventing, and punishing misclassification fraud isn't working the way it should. It's fractured, it's disjointed, and it gives our agencies um, and Minnesota to, to, uh, workers, it doesn't give them the problems, uh, the tools they need. So that's what this bill does. Um, it strengthens the enforcement tools for general misclassification law, um, and it gives specific tools to construction uh, that we've been working on for a while. The third thing it does is it creates an intergovernmental misclassification enforcement and education partnership, um, bringing together DLI, DEED, Revenue, Commerce, and the AG's office um, with a single goal of efficiently reducing misclassification fraud. You'll see that in all of those agencies are, are uh, represented in the fiscal note. And turning to that fiscal note um, on the cost side, there are two places in the fiscal note that show um, costs, the Department of, of Labor and the Department of Revenue. The other agencies involved um, have um, uh, um, said this is work that they're already doing or already staffing, um, and so they didn't see any additional costs. Um, on the, the, the Department of Revenue side, um, what their costs reflect is that they assumed some additional legal fees for reviewing and drafting agency to agency data sharing agreements. Um, it's work that the agencies already has staff that is already doing. They didn't say they needed any additional personnel, and so they said that they would absorb the 142,000 um, in fiscal year 2025. 
For the Department of Labor, they're estimating a slight increase in the number of complaints for misclassification given the, the change in policy and four additional investigations per year. And they said that would cost them um, approximately 500 or uh, 55,717 of cost for a labor investigator. They already have the resources uh, to do that in the personnel. And so they also have said that they'll adore, uh, absorb the um, the costs. Um, I'll note that in the future, in, in 2027, um, they're looking out and saying there might be 14,700 costs related to three additional administrative hearings in contested cases. That balances off against the, the increased revenue. On the revenue side, in the tails, the Department of Labor investigates bringing in uh, 667,000 a year in additional damages and penalties for violation um, uh, in fines and fees uh, for misclassified individuals. That does not count uh, the compensatory um, uh, damages that will come in that go directly to the workers. That's just the, 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 the um, additional fines and penalties that'll come back to the government. Um, it, it, and I can, walk through this a little bit more, but just in a nutshell, um, they estimate they're going to conduct four additional investigations. Um, and um, given their the, the, the factors they have to walk through in statute, that 600, 612,000 in addition to uh, misclassification penalties, another 90,000 in uh, registration related penalties, which relate to the independent contractor registration test um, uh, that they anticipate, and then $10,000 um, in one additional uh, penalty related to stop work orders. So I will close with um, uh, where I started, which is um, this bill uh, strengthens coordination and efficient, uh, effective efficiencies amongst agencies with, in most cases, authority that they already have um, and enforcement um, that they are already doing. It strengthens and, and um, in some cases, allows for additional enforcement, um, but that's reflected in the, the fiscal note is um, it allows the, the agencies that already have enforcement authority to do that enforcement better and more efficiently. With that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Discussion to the bill, Representative Novotny. Chair Olson, Representative Greenman, at a time when housing costs in Minnesota are exploding and we're getting priced out of the market for so many young people, will this bill increase or decrease the price of housing in this state? Representative Greenman. Thank you, um, uh, Madam Chair and, and um, Representative Novotny. Um, this bill does not, um, oh, this bill will ensure that we are cracking down on misclassification fraud that already exists um, and that, that where we're finding it. And so I think that the question is, if you think that in our construction sites, there's currently illegal misclassification fraud, it may change that cost. Um, but what we're trying to do here is ensure that uh, when workers are on the job, um, that they get all the protections and the legal protections that, um, that they are uh, obligated to get in law. So if you get hurt on the job, um, you uh, have workers' compensation. If you don't, it's uncompensated care that taxpayers are paying. If you get laid off, um, that you can have uh, um, unemployment insurance. Um, if you uh, um, work overtime, that you get the overtime pay that you're deserved under law. Um, and so that's what this bill does. Representative Novotny. Chair Olson, Representative Greenman, one last question. Um, doesn't look like the this uh, agency that you're setting up is going to be subject to open meeting laws. Why is that? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, er, and we've had a long discussion about this. It's not an additional agency. Um, it is bringing together the four government agencies, DEED, DLI, uh, Commerce, uh, and, uh, and Revenue, along with the Attorney General's Office that already have um, enforcement authority. If you uh, read the OLA report, the 2024 OLA report, one of the things it said in 2024, as well as in 20, uh, 2000, uh, um, uh, seven is that uh, there is no, there's not coordination happening. There's not data sharing happening. Um, in most cases, they already have the ability to do this. But what we have seen in other states is pulling them together um, in a partnership uh, where they are working together actually will increase the efficiency of their efforts and efficiency of government. Um, there is already rules that attach to these agencies in their um, in their. Um, uh, um, uh, as agencies, and so we think that that is sufficient. Representative Novotny. Thank you, Chair. 
Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to dovetail a little bit off of the conversation on Chapter 13D, which is the open meeting law. And um, Representative Greenman, you, you outlined um, a lot of the information about Chapter 13 and the data sharing, which um, could probably use some tightening up. I, we're going back and forth a lot on this data. It's not clear in your in your bill um, what that data is going to be used for, and if there's a breach, what's going to happen there, um, if there are any data trails. But on the Chapter 13D, the open <coughs> meeting piece, I think you made the case um, just now um, for making it subject to Chapter 13D open meeting laws. Every agency in government is subject to Chapter 13D. And you just outlined that this is a conglomeration of four different agencies. Um, you're calling it something else, but it's, it's a conglomeration of government agencies. And with that comes transparency. And so for, I, I don't know if you have any openness to being persuaded to um, making this law subject to Chapter 13D. You know, there, there really shouldn't be a government entity um, formed um, for which it, it's the, what happens within that entity is kept secret. And so is there any openness to making this subject to um, Chapter 13D, which is the open meeting law? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And we had a robust discussion about this in in-house judiciary. Um, I um, uh, just want to be clear, um, because what we're talking about, and for folks who haven't seen this bill, um, the majority of this of what the partnership is doing is bringing together enforcement authority, investigation enforcement authority. And so when DLI is doing enforcement and investigations, there are uh, um, uh, rules in Chapter 13 that apply. But my understanding, and I would have to look to the agency, is that when they are considering an investigation, um, they are not, in most cases, doing that. It may on all cases um, in an open meeting context because of the concerns that have been identified both in sharing information about the people being uh, and the companies being um, uh, um, investigated as well as uh, privacy around the victims. We have been very, very careful about that for that reason. Um, I'm happy to continue the conversation about um, how do we ensure that um, as it relates to the work that the public is both informed and, um, and has access. Um, and also I think we have been really, really um, careful about wanting to protect these investigations. Thank you. And I'll come back to you, Representative Scott. And I will say, we'll try to, well, a little leeway, but knowing it's been through judiciary and hopefully had some conversation about this already. But Representative Scott. Um, yeah, I, well, Chapter 13D doesn't fall under um, uh, the judiciary. 13D falls under um, GovOps or state gov finance or one of those. That, um, it's under their jurisdiction. And Representative um, Scott, it did go to state and local government finance and policy as well. So Representative Scott. Right, and it, and it wasn't brought up there. And um, I did have an amendment drafted to include it in the open meeting laws, but that I, I decided not to offer it here because it is a finance um, committee. But I, I did want to bring that up since it was brought up. And I think, um, <coughs> you know, yes, you're going to be dealing with some very sensitive information, but there's I, I don't see reporting. I don't see, um, I just don't see any, for lack of a better word, accountability in the bill where this entity is, I mean, it, it, it's the Wild West. There are no strings attached to anything that they're doing, really. So um, that concerns me a great deal. And Madam Speaker, with, or Madam Chair, with that, I'll, I'll stop my discussion on that um, issue. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Scott. Anyway. Yes, of course. Thank you, Representative Scott. Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, Representative Greenman, I was listening carefully to your conversation with us, and you had said that it will be a, uh, an estimated of four additional investigations per year, but you also said that the OLA in their updated report of 2024 stated that this is still a really big issue. So I'm really having a hard time conflating the two. 
So the department saying there's four more investigations that they would be doing, but the OLA is saying that it's a really big issue. Can you help me understand what the difference is? And then you also mentioned that the fines and fees would be bringing in $667,000 more, which if you have four more investigations, that's an awful lot of penalty for four investigations. So can you help me understand all of those? They don't really go together. Representative Greenman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative um, Rurik. Um, I agree that in a budget year, we need to increase the funding for investigations. We're never going to be able to investigate our way out of this. Um, right now, they will be able to do the investigations um, um, that they have capacity for, and in this year, um, we thought it was really important that we did this work, especially in light of the, um, the OLA report, but I think um, uh, giving the DLI um, um, uh, additional uh, investigators in the future is something that I'm interested in. We're not doing that this year. So that is sort of as, as it relates to the, the issue of um, of why there are not more investigations. Um, I think that uh, um, we're sort of right-sizing it for a non-budget year um, as, as we move forward. Um, on the questions of penalties, um, what we are anticipating is, and I think this is already reflective of, of a strategic uh, um, uh, um, orientation, but I think especially with the, the partnership even more so, is that the investigations, um, one, are, the, are where they will focus their energy is on the places, um, the bigger ish, the, the bigger problems um, that also have the potential to make uh, uh, change the strategic behavior. So there's lots of um, uh, different ways you could uh, um, investigate, but I think focusing on the places where we see systemic, um, uh, larger um, misclassification issues, I think that both the number that they estimate of it taking to, uh, on the higher end of how long it'll take them to do each investigation and also on the penalties um, reflects that, that approach. Representative Eric. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> All right, I still don't really understand why if we have four additional investigations, we're gonna be anticipating a $667,000 increase in fines and fees, but I will move on. Um, on page 23, if you've got your bill in front of you, page 23, I have some specific questions relating to those fees because I'm not really understanding the scope of who you are gonna be investigating and who is going to be impacted. So if we look at page 23, section 21, subdivision 10, um, specifically, so this is with the, the stop orders, or now you're changing it to stop work orders. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to follow this path of, of these folks. And, and I should say that I used to own a subcontracting business, so I know a little bit about this, and my husband is still a subcontractor. So I, I'm not uh, a novice in this. So if you look specifically at lines 23.22 down through about 27 or so, um, I'm trying to understand, like, the scope of the stop orders. So, for example, I'm just going to give you an example. So, Carl Sanderson's out there, okay? They're a big uh, general. So, so if Carl Sanderson's doing something at a school. I'll just give you an example of what my husband would do. So, Carl Sanderson, say they've got the contract. They're going to redo a school. They're doing the HVAC and other things and doing some remodeling. Then... Uh, train is hired by them to do components of the electrical. Not all the electrical, but some of it, like the controllers. So then my husband gets hired by train because he's an electrician that is a subcontractor under train. So, but he's a sole proprietor. So say someone in that level, okay? So that's kind of how construction works and sometimes it goes even beyond that. So say if there was somebody at that third or fourth tier that was uh, doing something wrong. Does that mean now Carl Sanderson all the way to the top, the general contractor, has to stop work at every single site that Carl Sanderson has because they have somebody at the fourth tier that is violating this? Can you let me know? Because I'm trying to read through this and understand, because it says things in here like cease, uh, the, so cessation of all business operations of a person, I'm not sure what you mean by a person, at one or more of the person's workplaces. So all of, it could be all of the workplaces and places of business or across all the person's workplaces and business places. So help me understand what, what you mean by a person um, and what, what do you mean in that, that section I, as far as like a, the example I just gave? How do you track that? 
Representative Greenman. Thank you. And I just wanted to, um, before I move to your question, um, just got uh, um, the penalties reflected in the bill are reflective of um, the four additional investigations plus the six investigations they're already um, conducting. So I just wanted to, to clarify that, that, that I misspoke. Um, okay. Um, I believe that, and I might actually have to um, call up uh, our commissioner uh, or our, uh, someone from DLI. I believe that we define that person is defined in this bill. Um, I'm just going to try to find where. Um, to your first question about how we define and who is involved, um, I thought that I see the commissioner is joining you. Do you? Does the commissioner feel ready to do this? Okay, great. And we'll 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 go forward with this discussion because it is related to the penalties and the mm -hmm. fees, which is relevant. So, um, welcome to the the committee, Commissioner Blissenbach. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Nicole Blissenbach. I'm the commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. Um, so, as to your question about stop work orders, uh, so the the person is is de, uh, defined in the bill. Um, but really the stop work order, and you can see this on lines 23.25, 23.26, it's issued to the person and the person here would be the, the entity that is violating the law. Um, that we have determined based on an inspection or an investigation has violated the ap applicable law. That is who would be subject to the stop work order. So um, I believe in the example that I, that uh, as I was following through, that would be the entity that is misclassifying um, employees as independent contractors. Uh, their operations could be subject to a stop work order. Representative Rare. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, so in the example that I gave, which is a, literally an everyday example in construction. So you got Carl Sanderson, they would be fine. So train, uh, so if, if train hired people, uh, well, they, they hire subcontractors. So if they gave a contract to somebody that wasn't a subcontractor, then train could be the bad entity. And so all of the work that all train does across all the state of Minnesota would be stopped potentially, which is a lot, by the way. Commissioner Blissenbach. Madam Chair, members of the committee, um, the stop work order would end at the entity that was violating the law. Um, it could be uh, beyond one place of business, but it really depends on what that investigation would show uh, or one one location, but it would be dependent upon what that investigation showed. Um, I'll just add stop work orders and stop orders as under our current authority are really reserved for the most egregious of conduct. Um, in talking with uh, others in the department, we've issued one in the last seven years. Um, so it's not something that we go into lightly. It's something that is there to really stop the most egregious uh, violative conduct that we see at the department. Further, Re Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, that, that might be, but we're changing the law. So we're giving you, giving the department exceptional authority. Uh, and I don't really understand what you mean by person. So I'll have to go back and reread that definition. But as you described it in your testimony, so if train made a mistake and the person wasn't a fully fledged subcontractor that should have been an employee, which I'm not saying they're doing that, but I'm just using that as an example because that's my world I live in, um, that... I'm familiar with. So you could, under this change, then go to all of the sites that train operates in and shut them down across the board. You could, because that's what we're changing it to. You would have that authority if we make this change in law. That's what your testimony is. Even though you may not choose to do that or you haven't chosen to do that, if we make this change, you certainly could do that if you wanted to. That's what I see, uh, and that's what I would strongly oppose as someone that uh, is still in the construction industry. This is incredibly problematic. That's why we have a very, very, very long list of people actually doing construction. There's a humongous list of, of opposition to this. Those that are actually building things all around us all the time. Um, it's unbelievable how many uh, folks have come forward to say we oppose this. So this may be one little piece of what they oppose, but uh, in my world, this would be incredibly problematic because it gives you so much more authority 
and encourages you to go do so much more uh, based on what the testimony was from the author that there's this is a big problem according to the OLA uh, and that this is just a right size so we haven't really hired we're not going to be hiring some new investigators but this is right sizing it so that we can hire some more when we have another budget cycle and we are going to be being very be very aggressive and assertive with making sure that uh, this is not happening but this has the potential of shutting down the construction industry in a fabulous way if they wanted to and and i don't think we should be putting that into statute thank you madam chair madam chair, madam chair. um just Rep to, okay representative greenman um to um to your point just on the definitions um if you look at um person is defined two places in the construction statute on uh 7.11 um and in the general myth class it's it's the same definition uh but it's on uh 5.25 thank you representative petersburg um, thank you madam chair and representative greenman my questions are kind of similar to representative Rarick. So because I haven't been in the committee before um, in hearing this, do you have, and I'm sure you have this information, do you have information on what is the alleged number of violations that this bill would correct into the future? In other words, and there must be some anticipation or expectation of what's going on now that is misclassification. And so do you have a number of, of those events that were actually being misclassified currently Rep representative Greenman thank you madam chair um, and thank you representative uh, Petersburg and this is my opportunity to be able to pitch the great work that the OLA does um, what they said is the answer is um, it's growing we don't have a great way to track it um, in many cases and um, uh, um, what they say is 22 percent of employers that have been audited uh, by the by the unemployment system um, have had at least one worker misclassified um, what that doesn't include is companies that don't have anybody um, um, who uh, who they have to report UI for so any of the places where there's either an all-cash economy or any businesses that show no em uh, employees um, would be uh, um, would not be in that um, one of the recommendations is that we um, actually think about how across those agencies um, those those three different agencies plus uh, well four different agencies plus the AG's office um, that that we um, uh, work on a way to more um, uh, to track and um, uh, and uh, and quantify the reality is is that there's four different tests and in workers comp there's 30 individual tests and so none of our agencies are actually looking at every um, uh, circumstance and ro running that test um, the conversation about the test and everything like that uh, moves forward but so the best number we have is 22 percent of employers um, uh, or of, of companies um, who are employing at least one person have misclassified uh, a worker or more representative Petersburg uh, thank you and, and so that kind of raises the question um, if I understood the uh, information that's presented especially in the fiscal note how how uh, Dolly got the six hundred and thirty seven thousand dollar fines was based on a, about 175 violations um, 175 violations across the entire state um, doesn't quite seem like it's 22 percent of the employees and it seems to me and the reason why I'm asking because of this committee is responsible for financing and we need to understand what the, the benefit is of what legislation we're putting in place and for 175 violations across the state this seems very excessive uh, kind of like driving a nail home with a sledgehammer uh, instead of uh, dealing with with the situation and so on. I have very big concerns about what this will do for that low number of violations that's going to be prosecuted each year. So that's my, my concern and why I think this is a bad bill. Go to Representative Greenman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I would just note that there's uh, four agencies and really three at the center that actually, um, it's not just DLI. Um, DEED, um, when somebody misclassifies a worker, um, they're not paying into the unemployment trust fund. And so there is a violation there um, that, and, and with revenue, um, when somebody is misclassifying a worker, they're not um, uh, um, reporting and, and doing the withholding. So there's actually, um, if we wanted to, to, to reflect the true cost 
or the true um, uh, size of the problem. One, there is probably more robust things we could do next year, uh, but this is a reflection of what we have the resources to do and making them more efficient um, uh, in order to, to be able to start to get a handle on, on what is a big problem. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, couple of questions. Representative Greenman, you said that uh, for paraphrase sake, uh, because this is a non-budget year, we're sort of kind of limping in with a, a little bit of money as opposed to what is likely to be a larger ask next year. Um, that seems a little concerning given the, the pendulum-like nature of majorities in a place like this. And it makes me wonder um, what sort of liability we wind up putting uh, on this non-government entity, government entity with, uh, as was pointed out, um, no open meeting law criterion. So I, I think that that's, that's, that's kind of irresponsible to, to get something off the ground that isn't, it, by your own admission, not fully funded and yet is going to uh, effectively create a, a burden on state government. But um, if the commissioner would come back up, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Nash, yes. Thank you, Is Madam it Chair. specifically related to with yep. it? Okay, sounds good, Representative yep. Nash. And I will just note with the fiscal note that the only cost it did show, just to clear up from that part, was a one-time cost in fiscal year 25 and 20, for the two agencies and nothing ongoing for maintaining the work. Uh, so I'll just make that. Hmm. Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Chair. And to the commissioner, you said something earlier when we were talking about Section 21 uh, specifically, my question starts on line 23.23 and goes downward. You had said that, uh, I think to Representative Rarick's question, that, that if there is a stop work order issued, that it is for one place. However, the bill on line 23.25 says workplaces, plural, and places of business. Um, so. My scenario that I'll be using is, uh, I, I'm not going to use names, but a large contractor has 25 jobs going on around the state, um, and something happens in one of them. There's an alleged misclassification, and the department is going to go and investigate that. According to the language in the bill on 23.25, workplaces, all of them, and that's common English, plural means all of them, so please either make us more clear on what you'd said earlier. You're, the, the scenario is that all of those could be shut down because that is plural, not what you had said previously of one single job site. Commissioner Blissenbach. Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, sorry if I misspoke. No, it absolutely is. We would look at the situation that's presented to us. If there are more than one site um, that we think would uh, promote the the compliance that we're seeking to achieve, we could do that, yes. And a common example, especially in the construction industry, is you have a an entity that is um, essentially misclassifying a number of employees on a number of different job sites. We had a, a, a recent enforcement action that involved the same um, subcontractor uh, with failure to pay wage and hour, uh, appropriate wage and hour for minimum wage and overtime on uh, 16 different job sites. Um, so it is common when you see misclassification that it's not just happening on one job site. And that is why it is important for us to be able to look at the whole of the situation and figure out what uh, action is necessary to curb the, the noncompliance we're seeing. Representative Nash. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, all those things being the case, you've already got a mechanism in place to, to handle with those, but I didn't hear uh, refuse, uh, a uh, repudiation of my idea that if something happens one time in one job site in an isolated inter incident, all other job sites could be, could be shut down, which you did just say. So that's even more terrifying uh, as somebody who has a lot of relationships in the trade industry, much like Representative Rarick. Uh, I have my best friend, the guy that I fish with all the time. We do, you know, we spend a lot of time together. He, he is oftentimes like a number three co subcontractor from a company. Um, if somebody further up the stack does something, my buddy's shut down. 
And and the the more uh, troubling thing is on 23.32, because government always moves so fast, <laughs> the order remains in effect until the commissioner issues an order lifting the stop work upon finding that the person has come into compliance with the applicable law, and it continues. Well, that's terrifying, because now my buddy who employs a number of people that work for him, being a number three contractor in the, in the housing construction trades, could be shut down because of one person on the other side of the Twin Cities misclassified somebody, and his job gets shut down on the, on the western edge of the cities. Um, that's, that's draconian. And I, you know, I saw a number of letters in here uh, against this. I didn't see anything from the unions or the trades advocating for this, but I'm wondering if maybe I just missed that in the packet. Um, I, I, I'm just troubled that this is uh, as heavy-handed and draconian. You've already got a mechanism to do this. We are creating a quasi-governmental agency, um, not subject to the o open meeting law, as Representative Scott said. Um, and you're, you're, you're shorting it on funds coming out of the gate. Uh, that's, that's fairly terrifying. Um, the compliance part of this also makes me raise an eyebrow. Not only is there going to be a heavy burden of compliance on the uh, contractors of all sort, because my buddy that I mentioned will oftentimes subcontract, so now he's got more compliance that he has to, to do. On top of that fantastic piece of legislation that you passed, uh, earned sick and safe time, paid family medical leave, there's compliance there. We're just shutting down business across the state. But um, for that reason, and not to steal any thunder from Representative Garofalo, I'm going to ask for a roll call on this. This is, um, this is bad legislation. So thank you. Representative Eric, did you have a short follow-up? Thank you. Uh, just a really quick thing. So uh, I think it's important for people to understand that are listening to this, which I hope hopefully there are some. Um, so the, chair, the uh, author pointed us to line 7.11 about definition of person. And, you know, just like we do here, it's, it's a very strange definition of what a person is. And um, I think it's important for the public to understand. And I understand that we're only changing one little bit of this, but a person is considered means an individual, a sole proprietor, an LLC, a uh, limited liab liability partnership, a corporation, a partnership, an incorporated or unincorporated association, a joint stock company, or any other legal or commercial entity. So it literally is every definition of business that I can think of off the top of my head. So it's not just a sole proprietor, one kind of, it, it's everything. It's a corporation, a partnership, an LLC. Um, it, it's everything. So I'm not sure why we're using the word person, and I understand that's an underlying statute, but it's a misnomer when we're talking about, you know, back to page 23, that when you insert literally every business, like I said, you know, if Train uh, had somebody that came on that wasn't a full LLC or a, you know, they were something else, and I'm not saying Train's doing this, I'm just saying that as an example. Now you could, with this new authority, this is new authority, you could shut down every single site that train has work. That's what you can do with this. And this is egregious. And this is beyond the pale of expansion of government authority, crushing, again, the construction industry and business as a whole. This is terrible. So with that, I'm going to go to lead Garofalo to close. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And I don't know what Representative Nash is talking about. I I'm thunderless. I have no thunder, Madam Chair, so I don't. Um, Representative Grayman, first of all, I want to thank you for taking some time last week in the retiring room uh, to walk me through um, some of our more general conversations on independent contractors. It actually was helpful, and I just want to say uh, thank you. And I, I look forward to you and I syncing up our vocabulary, the words that we use um, frequently or infrequently. It's an inside joke. Um, so just one thing, I, and members have talked about this, can you just sync up for me how we have this OLA report about 22% of misclassification, but we're not seeing a dramatic change in the fiscal note. How, how can both those things be true? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, and I appreciate the conversation, uh, um, Chair, or Lead Garofalo. Um, uh, 
as I said, and I think the reality, and I think this is the reality with most of our um, agency enforcement, um, is we will be able to do the enforcement that we have resources for. Um, and so um, I will say that one of the things, and one of the things that the OLA report says, and one of the reasons we're doing um, this partnership, uh, um, uh, um, uh, this enforcement partnership is one of the things they say is we're actually not doing, a, that agencies are not doing a very good job uh, of of doing, of using the economies of scale and the coordination that should happen. So misclassification is not just a problem of minimum wage or wage an hour. It's not just a problem of uh, um, not paying into the unemployment trust fund. It's not just an hour of uh, a, a problem of not having workers' compensation insurance. It's all of those things, but it's based on the same set of facts. Um, and so one of the things that we anticipate doing is getting, and one of the, the real uh, um, goals this year um, in response to both the OLA report, but also the OLA report in 2007 is saying for the enforcement that is already happening, uh, agencies should be sharing information. They should be identifying the places that they're seeing this a lot. Um, that will make the, the, the work and the people who are actually doing the work uh, more uh, efficient, uh, efficient and efficient. I don't think it is um, shorting this. Um, uh, I think that what we're doing is setting up and strengthening the foundation uh, uh, um, for future and really to take on this problem, which we haven't done since the 2007 OLA report. And Representative Graffo. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and Representative Greenman. Um, with regards to the stop work orders section of this bill, um, I guess I view that as the economic and employer equivalent of a death penalty. Yeah. I mean, that's what a work order is. Do, do you understand why when people whose livelihood is tied to this behavior see this expansion of authority, do you understand what their concerns are? Representative Greenman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Lee Garofalo. I think that that was reflected in the, um, in the uh, um, testimony of the commissioner, which is um, this is a tool, and it's a tool like the, the federal government has the hot goods uh, tool. It is a tool that is not used, that was used one time in the last seven years, that's really used um, in, in these really egregious situations. One thing I will say, and this came out in the OLA report, this came out in, in committee after committee, is right now the economic incentive is to violate the law. Right now, if you misclassify a worker, um, one, you may or may not, given enforcement, you may or may not um, uh, have it detected. It may or may not be enforced. Um, the, the, what the, the OLA report says is uh, deed um, basically will just ask you to, to pay back the, uh, uh, the UI. So it's basically a, um, uh, you may or may not get a penalty, and the penalties aren't that great. So what we're trying to do is level the playing field and say, um, you should actually have an, uh, a, a, a legal and a monetary and a how you do your work business reason to comply with the law as it is, because that's going to protect workers. But it's also going to protect taxpayers who are in the good businesses that we heard testimony after testimony from construction workers who said, or from construction businesses who said, we can't make it pencil out. When we are doing what we're supposed to do, we are bidding it, we are getting outbid by people who are not paying the true cost of doing business. They're not paying the taxes. And so what we're trying to do is say, here is the authority and the enforcement authority that you have to deter people from doing this in the first place, which is also ultimately the most efficient way to, to address this problem. And it's also the, 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 less, the least costly for government. Lee Garofalo. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. And Representative Greenman, um, just to be clear, I, I'm, I am aware of your advocacy for the bill and what you want to have happen. I was just, my question was specifically, around stop work orders and how my assessment of that is it's an economic death penalty. And I just, I just wanted to see if you had visibility to understand why legitimate actors are concerned about that language. Certainly um, misclassification of independent contractors in the construction industry is a huge problem. And you have highlighted that there are economic incentives for people uh, workers don't know this, they show up at a job site, they're told to sign this stuff. That's a legitimate problem. But I think there's a Venn diagram where there's an overlap here, and that is that there's a problem. But when you're expanding this authority for an economic death penalty, that those concerns are justified and should be addressed. Um, again, you, you don't have to respond to that. I just, I just want to make sure you are aware, if you're 
why there's so much noise. There are lawful businesses that are doing the right thing who are contacting legislators about their concerns specifically about those provisions. Um, going more generally into independent contractors and the specific um, uh, specific fiscal notes, do, do these do any of these provisions um, impact independent contractors who are rideshare drivers? Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Lee Garofalo. We do not change the test um, or touch the test for um, general misclassification, which is where rideshare drivers uh, will be found. And so the sort of the, the current law applies to them um, as it it will tomorrow, as it did yesterday. Thank you, Lee Garofalo. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Greenman. And under current law, are rideshare drivers independent contractors? Representative Greenman. You are asked, uh, 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 Chair um, uh, Olson, um, you're asking a question that I think could get litigated, but is not for me to espouse upon. Lee Garofalo. I have no further questions. <laughs> thank you. Great. And I'll go to um, Representative Greenman for last word. But thank you for the work on the bill and having carried a bill uh, that was about protecting workers last year and so much of the discussion being around the penalties and why it's here. I think your goal here is one that we're trying to protect workers. And if you follow the law, these penalties shouldn't be a threat. And so I want to say thank you for your work on uh, this bill. And Representative Greenman, uh, please, final word on the bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members, for, for a discussion. Um, um, as in this committee, um, we don't get to hear, you don't get to hear the workers, um, the, the, the businesses, the folks who have been coming and working on this, this issue um, and, and raising their voices. And so I hope um, uh, folks want, want um, are listening, um, listening to all of that. Um, this um, is and should not be a partisan issue. Um, what we are doing here is saying that um, that the, the safety net that we have created, whether it's making sure that if you work 50 hours, you're paid for that overtime, or if you get hurt on the job, you don't show up at the hospital um, and, um, and not have any way to pay either that bill or uh, your, your injury. Um, those are things, again, um, we should center the worker, Minnesota workers, also, we need to center our obligation to taxpayers and to our communities, which is misclassification is depriving the UI trust fund that we've spent a lot of time talking about the stability of it. If people are avoiding paying into it, it compromises that. If we are uh, talking about uncompensated care, we are paying for that. Our, our, um, our taxpayers are paying for that. Um, and so, as we think about this conversation, I think it's important that we think about that. And, um, and to what, what Chair Olson just said, the goal here, the best case scenario, is that um, is is deterrence is that people get um, what they um, what legally um, they have rights to and that we have no enforcement the problem right now is that we have an unevil playing field where there's actually economic incentives um, that we have seen play out um, to uh, to violate the law and to provide our um, uh, cheat workers out of what they deserve and cheat uh, taxpayers um, and our um, uh, revenue out of um, uh, the um, the sustainability and solvency it should have. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, I'd uh, ask for you to send it to the General Register. Great. And there is a roll call. So before you do that, I will just renew my motion that House File 4444 be placed on the General Register and have the clerk take the roll. Chair Olson. Aye. Olson. Aye. Vice Chair Edelson. Aye. Edelson. Aye. Uh, Lead Garofalo? No. Garofalo, no. Representative Acom? Aye. Acom, aye. Representative Agbaje? Aye. Agbaje, aye. Representative Becker Finn is excused. Representative Freiberg? Yes. Freiberg, aye. Representative Gomez is excused. Representative Hassan? Aye. Hassan, aye. Representative Heinzman? No. Heinzman, no. Representative Hornstein? Aye. Hornstein, aye. Representative Howard? Aye. Howard, aye. Representative Cleborn? Cleborn, aye. Cleborn, aye. Representative Creshaw? No. Creshaw, no. Representative Liebling? Aye. Liebling, aye. Representative Lilly? Lilly, aye. Lilly, aye. Representative Moeller? Aye. Moeller, aye. Representative Nash? No. Nash, no. Representative Noor? Noor, aye. Noor, aye. Representative Novotny? 
Novotny, no. Representative Pulowski is excused. Representative Petersburg? No. Petersburg, no. Representative Farr is excused. Representative Pinto? Aye. Pinto, aye. Representative Rarick? No. Rarick, no. Representative Schumacher? Schumacher, no. Schumacher, no. Representative Scott? No. Scott, no. Representative Joachim? Joachim, yes. Joachim, aye. Madam Chair, there are 15 ayes, 9 nays, and 4 excused. There being 15 ayes and 9 nays, the motion prevails and House File 4444 has been placed on the General Register. Thank you, Representative Greenman. Our last piece of business today is amendment to the budget resolution. And so I move that the 2024 budget, House Budget Resolution coded BUD Res 04. And I also move the A01 amendment to the budget resolution. And so the change you're seeing in front of us does two things. It changes the labor target from 1 million to 9.571 million. And it changes the workforce development fund target from zero to 17 million. And this still uh, jives with the joint targets that were agreed to. It's just moving things um, into different areas. And I will have Miss Adrian's also. She has the tracking sheet from our packet. Uh, Eric, tracking sheet is in our packet as well to discuss. And I don't know, if Miss Adrian's, if there's anything you want to say to that. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, the only thing I'll point out is the tracking sheet only reflects the general fund changes. So you'll see on line 20, this is the new labor target of 9.571 million. And the workforce development fund is not a general fund amount, so that is not reflected on the sheet. Any discussion to the budget resolution amendment? Representative Rarick. Thank you, Madam Chair. What is the balance right now of the workforce development fund? Uh, Ms. Adrians. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Rarick. It is for the fiscal year 24-25 biennium, the balance is about $85 million. Further discussion to the budget resolution amendment. Lead Garofalo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So is the money for the Department of Labor and Industry, the increase, is that going to be used for the new state-run rideshare app? Is that what that money's being spent for? Representative Garofalo, um, we haven't seen the labor budget, but I would not hold your breath. Okay. All right. <laughs> Any further discussion? How about the Workforce Development Fund, Madam Chair? Will, they use, will that be used for the new... Representative Garofalo, um, we haven't seen those budgets come through, but I'd, I wouldn't hold your breath. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I, I would just say I, I think we, we don't Garofalo. need to be spending any more money, and I'm voting no, but thank you. Thank you. And we didn't actually change the overall spend. We just moved the money around. So, in terms of the budget resolution, this is, ma'am, I'm sorry, Rep Lee Garofalo. So, this is coming from like the, I don't want to say slush fund, but the, the leftover. Globe, so, the global agreement is still intact with the total amount of spending, yes. The money on the bottom line. Correct, yes. Lee Garofalo. All right, so with that, I move the adoption of the A01 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The amendment is adopted. And I move the adoption of the budget resolution coded Bud Res 04 as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, please say no. No. The motion prevails, and the budget resolution as amended has been adopted. And I just want to say, I think everyone got a notification about a meeting happening at 11 o'clock in 500 North GOP you're free you don't have to come to that um, to our members I would still like we'll just have a brief caucus being we weren't able to caucus earlier about uh, a few items so if you can make it up to 500 North we'll just have a quick oh, meeting together I'm sure I had accepted the meeting uh, you did can I still come you probably not oh representative Nash you're free to huddle on your own what happened, what happened to will provide snacks and I, I will say the last thing too just quickly we don't have committee on Monday because of the break, but you can look forward to a likely Wednesday evening hearing next week. So, and that's the only other business in front of us. We are adjourned.